So to the public, if you have any questions during the talks or after, please do not hesitate to put them in the Q&A. And uh, for those of you who just joined us, discussion is planned after the three talks so that we can have a panel-like uh, discussion. So I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Natasha Jarman, nominated by Croatia. Uh, Natasha is a lexicographer in the field of natural sciences, biomedicine and biotechnology, and is affiliated to the Miroslav Kralja Institute of Lexicography in Zagreb. Her research interests lie in the field of information and communication sciences and cover scientometrics and its role in science policy, as well as lexicography and encyclopedias in the digital humanities area. So her, the title of her talk is Contribution of Encyclopedic Projects to the History of Technology in Croatia. And I'm happy to give the floor to her uh, now. Please, Natasha. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to organizers and uh, to all the colleagues. And uh, yes, I'm very pleased to, to be a part of this uh, unique uh, event. Uh, the aim of my presentation, now let me just share the slide, uh, uh, which I prepared with... Um, Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, so the aim of my presentation, uh, which I prepared, to pre prepared together with uh, my colleague Zdenko Jecic, who is the editor-in-chief of the Croatian Encyclopedia of Technology, is to give a brief overview of the history of technology in Croatia with a special emphasis on the contribution of encyclopedic projects in this field. First of all, allow me to say a few words about Croatia and its legacy. Croatia is a Mediterranean country located uh, by the Adriatic Sea in the Southeast Europe, but it has also always been a part of the Central European cultural surrounding. Croatia embraced the positive influences of Italy, Austria, Hungary, which governed its territories for centuries, and as a result, it holds a rather rich technological heritage. Thanks to the work of several world-acknowledged Croatian-born inventors and scientists, some of the foundations of Croatian technology heritage are well elaborated and documented. For example, Faust Vrancic, the Renaissance polymath and inventor from the Dalmatian town of Šibenik, is considered to be one of the first constructors of the parachute. As well, he described many other invent inventions in his book, Machine Nove. Ruzer Boskovic, a scientist and philosopher from Dubrovnik, was the author of a number of works in the field of mathematics and natural sciences, and among other things, introduced scientific methods into the study of architectural constructions. Ivan Blazvukic from Rijeka was the first to expound the idea of self-propelled torpedo, and he influenced the beginning of torpedo production in Rijeka factory, which became the leading supplier to the major world navies until the end of First World War. And Nikola Tesla, born in the Croatian village of Smiljan, is considered to be one of the greatest inventors in the field of electric power. He installed the first power station at Niagara Falls and influenced the opening of the world's second power station on the Croatian river of Krka, Plovdušibenik, only two days after the Niagara one. In spite of all that has been said, uh, the fact is that the field of history of technology in Croatia has been moderately researched and documented. The main actors in this field are scientific institutions, museums, associations, and conferences, some of which are listed on this slide, and the majority of researchers or professionals that are involved in the research and presentation of the history and philosophy of science and technology are coming from the social sciences and humanities. The museums have been the main actors to, that strive to promote the technology heritage to the public. And one of the main roles in presentation and popularization of the Croatian technology heritage belongs to the Technical Museum Nikola Tesla in Zagreb. There is a number of actors involved in the history of technology in Rijeka, Croatia's coastal town with the rich industrial heritage. This has certainly influenced the decision that Rijeka was designated the European Capital of Culture in 2020. In 2014, the Miroslav Krleža Institute of Lexicography in Zagreb joined the list of institutions involved in the Croatian history of technology research and presentation when the idea of creating the Croatian Encyclopedia of Technology was launched. 
that the aims and objective or the main purpose of this encyclopedia is to comprehensively summarize the field's knowledge and to present it to specialists as well as to the broader audience. Besides its contribution to understanding the role of technology in the social and cultural context, its purpose is to serve as a platform for future research into the Croatian history of technology and to build bridges between social sciences and humanities on the one hand and engineering and the natural sciences on the other. So why exactly an encyclopedia? The encyclopedia seemed to be a good choice as there is a lack of national experts who could take on the responsibility. I stopped sharing or, sorry. Uh, Natasha, um, yes, you stopped sharing now. Uh, we could on, you were always stuck on slide one. Uh, really? At all. Oh my and, God. Yes. Let me see what happened. Do you see this one now or? Yes, so I see why, why exactly an encyclopedia. Oh, that I'm is so sorry. So you haven't seen the, the rest of them. Oh, I'm sorry. And now does it go further or? Wait. What happened here? No, it didn't. Let me try, let me try uh, like this. Is it going? Do you yes, see now it's moving. I, it's moving. I'm I see so maps sorry. Yes. So I'm so sorry. So these were the, no <laughs> the, nice, the nice slides that I wanted to show actually while talking, but okay. Let me just skip. You should have warned me. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah, so now we, we came to, uh, we arrived to this one. So I said that uh, why exactly an encyclopedia? Because it was, um, it seemed to be a good choice as there is a lack of national experts who could take on responsibility of carrying out in-depth historiographical description of different technology areas. Whereas an encyclopedia is created with a joint participation of a large number of high profile researchers and specialists and professional editors or lexicographers. And last but not least, Croatia has a five century long tradition in lexicography. Let me go, sorry. Do you see the slide now, the next slide? Yes, yes. Okay. So as the one of the prominent examples of the importance of lexicography and encyclopedistics in Croatia is the very existence of the existence of the Miroslav Karaja Institute of Lexicography, a publishing house and a scientific institution, which is defined in a governmental act as a public institution of a special interest for the Republic of Croatia. The Institute was uh, established, founded in 1950, and it possesses the necessary infrastructure crucial for carrying out such a demanding project uh, as the National Encyclopedia of Technology. With a mission to systematize, preserve, and disseminate scientifically verified knowledge in the broadest span of scientific disciplines, the Institute has published so far more than 400 volumes of encyclopedias, lexicon, dictionaries, bibliographies, and other editions from nearly all fields of human knowledge. Among those editions, let me highlight uh, just a few that are connected to the field of technology. For example, uh, Encyclopedia of Technology, uh, which had a broad scope of covering the field of technology as a whole, and which has been digitized by now as an archival edition. Then a maritime encyclopedia is considered to be a unique work in encyclopedic publishing that may not even be found in a great maritime oriented countries throughout the world. Additionally, uh, some other encyclopedias deal with partly, at least partly with the history of technology and of course science, for example, the general creation encyclopedia. And in addition, it is also worth mentioning that archival print editions have been digitized since 2008 and some two, uh, 270,000 encyclopedic articles are available in open access. However, uh, there was a lack of uh, an encyclopedic project that would comprehensively cover the national history of technology. And as already mentioned, a creation encyclopedia of technology was initiated in 2014. From the very beginning, this project strives to collaborate with all relevant in, in institutions and experts from all across the wide technological community. 
Uh, the encyclopedia is in, in an innovative project in Croatia, being the first encyclopedia uh, which is published simultaneously as print and an online edition. All written and edited entries upon approval of the editorial board are published at the portal of the Croatian Technology Heritage. Simultaneously, the print edition is being prepared with the plan of publishing four volumes. Um, so far, two volumes have been published. And this is the example of, of uh, the layout of the print edition. The portal of uh, Croatian Technology Heritage is available in open access at this web address shown on this slide. Let me just briefly refer to the properties of this portal of Croatian Technology Heritage. The homepage uh, contains sections, like, for example, the latest articles, selected articles or um, uh, did you know section that offers additional information and curiosities and also uh, the um, uh, digitized archival encyclopedia of technology and lexicon of uh, technology are uh, available here. The core of the po portal comprises of articles from Croatian encyclopedia of technology and the online version of this encyclopedia is enriched with additional functionalities and data. Content related data at the end of each article uh, primarily are aimed at linking with external sources uh, to enable further exploration of a topic and extract extracted set of metadata uh, here on the right uh, hand side in info boxes uh, serve as a brief content overview. They also allow for multiple queries to the database and enable the interoperability with digital repositories of other cultural and uh, uh, scientific institutions. So uh, this portal of Croatian technology heritage contributes uh, to a number of properties which are listed here. Uh, it offers accessibility uh, to scientifically verified information of Croatian technology and its adequate representation in educational system and public perception. Also, uh, it contributes to the development of the research into the history of technology, revalorization and sustainability of the technology heritage, and of course, the exchange of information at the international level and positioning of Croatian technology in the global context. And lastly, I just wanted uh, to say uh, and to emphasize that encyclopedic portals in general represent a step forward towards a new encyclopedic concept having following characteristics. Ways of preparing, organizing and presenting encyclopedic knowledge has changed as digital technologies enabled continuous updating and expanding of the content, as well as collaboration and cooperation between content providers and users. They give possibilities of linking to the digital data and collections of other research and cultural institutions. Uh, and as such, they could also serve as platforms for data networking and sharing, a sort of junction points that uh, connect uh, diverse uh, digital content on a specific topic. With that being said, let me just conclude by saying that we think that one of the possible directions of the future de development of the history of technology research, and especially its uh, presentation and dissemination, may lie in encyclopedic uh, projects. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natasha. So to the public, I repeat again, if you have any questions uh, based on Natasha's uh, wonderful talk, please don't hesitate to put them uh, in the Q&A for, uh, for the discussion later on. So uh, our second speaker in this panel is Noah Efron, uh, who was nominated by Israel. Uh, Noah, Noah is affiliated to the Bar Ilan University, where he was also the founding chairperson of the program in science, technology and society. His research focuses in particular on the complex interactions between knowledge, religions, and politics. And this is, I think, a topic that seems all the more relevant in our difficult times we are living uh, today. His talk is titled History of Science at the Crossroads, and I'm happy to give the floor to him uh, just now. Uh, Noah? Thank you very much, and what a pleasure to be here. So in March 1985, the journal ISIS published an odd essay it called A Guest Editorial by Yuda Elkanah and Michael Segre, 
headlined History of Science in Israel. Yudah Elkanah was the undisputed leader of the field of HPS, History and Philosophy of Science in Israel. He had by then founded the pioneering program in the field at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and left that to start the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas at Tel Aviv University. Along the way, in, 19, in 1968, he became the director of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, a sort of think tank and institute for advanced study that occupies a lush, sprawling campus that abuts the residence of Israel's president. And as director of the Van Leer, Yud El Kana turned a good deal of the Institute's focus and resources towards the history and philosophy of science, building what was then maybe the country's finest library on the subject and supporting doctoral and postdoctoral students in the field. Yud Al Kana's co author, Michael Segre, was at the time one such young postdoc. The ISIS essay describes history of science in the first decades of Israel's existence as a field of scholarship practiced by a few scientist luminaries like physicist Samuel Samborski and biologist Fritz Bodenheimer conducting end of their career historical research into the fields in which they had made their names more or less on their own. This was the tenor of things, this kind of antiquarian history of science until Alcana himself returned to the country with a Brandeis doctorate and a year of teaching his junior faculty at Harvard under his belt and set up all that he set up in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv with the aim of putting history of science on a more stable and reliable foundation. The ISIS essay describes all this dryly and then ends on a reflective note, quote, serious problems remain. It is vital that students acquire a more solid grounding in the techniques of historical scholarship, such as textual criticism and in those of analytic philosophical thought end quote. It's striking from a remove of almost 40 years to register how traditional Elkanah's approach was, how high modernist with its faith in textual criticism and analytic philosophy, and this at a time when postmodernism had already started on the downward slope of its storied career. As a prominent public intellectual, Elkanah was known for holding unconventional views that he set out brilliantly and with verve in interviews on television and radio and papers. Elkanah caused a stir, for instance, when he wrote in 1988 an article in the newspaper Haaretz called In Favor of Forgetting that started, quote, as a 10-year-old boy, I was taken to Auschwitz and I went through the Holocaust. And the article ends, quote, we must root out the historical power that remembering the Holocaust holds over us. The article that sparked protests in the streets called for a moratorium on teaching the Holocaust to Israeli kids in Israeli schools. Yet when it came to history of science, there was a great deal of traditionalism to Elkanah's approach. He supervised dissertations on Galileo, Lewinhoek, Descartes, and Duhem. He hired lecturers who were experts on ancient Greek mathematics, on medieval natural philosophy, on Renaissance physics, on Galileo, on Newton, and on William Ewell. Among the international conferences he organized were one devoted to Newton and another devoted to Leibniz. Reflecting on the state of history of science in Israel in 1985 in that essay, Elkanah and Segre wrote that, quote, one problem concerns the relationship between modernization and tradition in a society emotionally, politically, and culturally conditioned by its ancient roots, end quote. The problem that Elkanah referred to elliptically here seems to have been that in a place like Israel, there is always a danger that an atavistic and irrational parochialism might seize the imagination of local students, putting them somehow at odds with the study of the advance of rational Western science. The ISIS essay goes on to say that, quote, it seems inevitable that demand for the study of indigenous historical sources will increase, end quote. Up until that point, most Israeli historical studies, such as there were of Jewish 
engagements in natural philosophy and natural history and mathematics were carried out by scholars of Jewish history and Judaic studies working mostly in the Wissenschaft des Judentums tradition and focused mostly on the medieval period. Yuda Elkanah understood that future scholars too would likely turn their attention to such subjects, to such Jewish subjects. It seemed inevitable, as he said, and this was a source of concern. When I proposed to write my own dissertation on the history of Israeli science in the first decades of the state, Yehuda discouraged me. After I changed my plans and chose to write my dissertation about a minor figure in 16th century Rudolphine Prague named David Gantz, who visited Tycho Brahe at his observatory and wrote in fine Hebrew with enthusiasm about Kepler, Yuda Elkanah called me into his office to ask why I picked so odd and so esoteric a topic and to say that so parochial a study would be of little interest to anyone. Some insight into why he felt this way can maybe be gained from the final paragraph of the ISIS special editorial, which reads, quote, the combined area of history, philosophy, and sociology of science provides what are probably the best means to resolve issues of tradition and modernization in a multicultural society. This extension and coalition of academic and intellectual resources will promote peaceful coexistence in a torn and polarized area of the world. Elkanah's vision of the place of history of science in Israeli public discourse then, or part of it anyway, was as a hedge against the parochialism of tradition, and I think as an agent of modernization and acculturation to the Western liberal European tradition. Israel in 1984 was a country with a bit over 4 million people, of whom 20% were Palestinian, roughly 10% were ultra-Orthodox Jews of European descent, 40% were Sfaradim, immigrants or children of immigrants from the Middle East or North Africa, most of them religious, and growing numbers of new immigrants who came in recent influxes from Ethiopia and from the land still then controlled by the Soviet Union. Elkanah saw in the study of the history and philosophy of science a tool, one among many, no doubt, to promote modernization in this very multicultural, far from straight up Western society. In order to serve this end, the science to be studied ought best be the science that was the exemplar of the Western intellectual tradition from the Greeks through Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, and so on. In a place like Israel, so full of forces and impulses he saw as mystological and obscurantist, Yehuda Elkanah believed that the history and philosophy of proper science, properly taught, could nudge people toward modern liberalism and affect all the more important, owing to the fact that Israel found itself in a broader Middle East, so full of forces and impulses that Elkanah saw too as mostly mystological and obscurantist. This then was the political identity of history of science in the years it first took shape in Israel. And this political identity may perhaps explain in part anyway, its astonishing success. By the early 1990s, there were more than 400 Grad, students getting advanced graduate degrees in the field, making it probably the single most popular humanities graduate degree in the country, indeed in the history of the country. Maybe more significant, this was the political identity of history of science that played so big a part in one time prime minister, later president of Israel, Shimon Peres's vision of a new Middle East, one in which Peres hoped the entire region would finally follow the advice of fin de siècle Turkish intellectual Hussein Kayit, who said that the time had come, quote, to leave those Arab books and embrace passionately the modern books that can fill our brains with the sciences and techniques of the modern world, which modern sciences and techniques would free all those who lived in the region from the chains of our violent and primitive parochial pasts. The hold that this sort of view had on the field lasted for a long time and only slowly lost its force and to this day, not entirely still. What the tight focus on traditional European history of science with its assumption that European science is a crucial element of modernization and with its assumption that modernization is an ineluctable and necessary element of promoting peaceful coexistence in a torn and polarized as of yet not still fully modern area of the world. What all this kept 
us for decades from producing as scholars and from teaching our students to produce were critical studies of the crucial and complicated roles that medicine, science, and scientific technologies have played in the history of Zionism and of Israel, and more broadly, the crucial and complicated roles that scientific modernization has played in this torn and polarized area of the world. Of course, the theme of this festival is the future of history of science and technology and history of science and technology for the future. And historian that I am, all I have talked about until now is the past. But I think that the past offers important lessons about what the future ought and ought not be, at least here in the little rooftop study cell in Tel Aviv from which I'm speaking to you. It ought to be local and it ought to be alive to the complicated roles that science, medicine, and technology have played in establishing and sustaining social and political orders, military orders, hegemonies, re regimes of oppression, and all the rest. It ought to be self-reflective as well, taking measure and making sense of the roles that we in the field, through the field, have played in sustaining social and political and military orders, hegemonies, regimes of oppression, and all the rest, though, without aggrandizing ourselves. We've never been all that important or influential, but we have been, I think, people of some status anyway, and people with lots of open-hearted students, people who have oftentimes as well, oftentimes as well, been on the wrong side of, well, things that really matter. Of course, the future of the history of Israeli science, technology, and medicine is in different hands than those that guided the field in the past. These different hands belonging mostly to young scholars trained and working mostly outside the country. Scholars like Tamar Novik in Berlin, who's just now out book Milk and Honey, traces the ways in which settlers and state experts used agricultural technology to support Zionist claims to the land, or Basma Fahum's soon to be finished Stanford dissertation on the history of tobacco cultivation in Ottoman and mandatory Palestine, or Nimrod Ben Zaev's study of race, colonialism, and construction work in mandatory Palestine, or Shira Wilkoff's Berkeley dissertation on Zionist urban planning and the politics of space in mandatory Palestine and Israel, or Dotana Levy's recent Columbia dissertation and one imagines forthcoming book called Stripped, Ruination, Liminality, and the Making of the Gaza Strip, 1840 to 1950. In short, if the history of science, technology, and medicine in Israel in the past was gripped by a hope that the discipline might promote peaceful coexistence in a torn and polarized area of the world, scholars of the history of science, technology, and medicine in Israel in the future must continue to turn our gaze to the many exquisitely ramified roles science, technology, and medicine have played in tearing apart and polarizing this area in the world and maintaining socio-political orders that have brought, among so many other things, so much grief to so many. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Noah, for this passionate uh, talk. So again, I repeat, if anyone in the public has questions, do not hesitate to uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, so I'm now happy to introduce our third and final speaker of today, uh, Roland Twitche, who was nominated by the Scientific Instruments uh, Commission. So Roland is associate um, professor. Uh, I, I uh, sorry, I, I lost my, my, my little bio I prepared. <laughs> At the Indian, uh, is associate professor in history of science and technology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and president of the Scientific Instrument Commission. He currently works on the circulation of technical and scientific knowledge, people, and objects between India and Europe after 1945, and is in charge of establishing the archive of IIT Madras. So the title of his talk is Rethinking Scientific Instruments and Education in History of Science, and I'm happy to give him the floor. Please, Roland. Okay, thank you very much. I have shared my screen. I hope you can see my slide. And uh, when I move the slide, we will have to figure out whether it moves or not. If not, I go to a different mode. Okay, thank you very much for all coming. So usually when we talk about the relationship between the history of science and sci science education, we talk mainly about mobilizing the history of science uh, in science education to talk about the nature of science, science and society, scientific controversies or shifting paradigms. In our understanding, still 
Uh, research is a defining feature of science and scientific activity and research only. New scientific knowledge is then produced in research and in a linear model handed down to schools, technical colleges, and uh, uh, and universities uh, that don't produce uh, scientific knowledge, but that reproduce uh, scientific knowledge. And apart from a few exceptions, I would mention here Catherine Olesko or Josef Simon, who was actually seen in the audience, so I think he's here, uh, Salik Polstedt, Deborah Warner, or David Kaiser, Science teaching does not feature uh, or features only in the periphery of our histories of science. In recent decades, we had a growing interest in science and uh, the public in history of science, for example, in amateur science, science and film and literature and other places like the, the zoo, the, uh, the pub. But teaching in schools and colleges does not really feature uh, in our stories of science at the public, even though schools and colleges are the most important actors in connecting science with society. In my presentation, I want to turn this relationship between research and education around and place education in its various forms and institutions in the center of our histories of science. And I will, as a president of the Scientific Instrument Commission, uh, focus on scientific instruments and other material cultures in science education. So now, do you see the slide moving? Okay, great. So I would like to propose four dislocations in uh, the history of uh, science. Uh, one, the first one is placing history of education in, in the center of our understanding of history of science. So education, as I said, does not feature very, very prominently. Some authors even see uh, the education as totally separate from the history of science. And some also have put it in competition, right? Like teaching is what keeps university professors from research. And I, I would also suggest that this is connected to the low status actually teaching and pedagogy has in academia. Thomas Kuhn and Ludwig Fleck obviously saw science teaching as important for the formation of paradigms and uh, uh, thought collectives within the scientific community, so important for the reproduction of the scientific community. At universities, we can all say there's a synergy between teaching and research. Uh, uh, students are a resource in research, but I think this kind of history uh, or historiography of uh, uh, history of science teaching for the reproduction of the scientific community has a big flaw. And that is, even at universities, the vast majorities of students don't become practicing scientists. And most science teaching does not even take place at universities, but it takes in schools, in primary and red secondary schools, and at different levels of technical education and vocational training, technical colleges, engineering colleges, and obviously the role of science education in society in general and broad is not mainly the reproduction of the scientific community. Obviously, that's an important point, but it's not at the core of science teaching. So I, I insist that what we have to do is to ask questions. What was taught to these students? Uh, why was it taught to them? And how was it taught to them? What did these students actually learn, which is obviously a difference between the teaching and what the, what students take home. Where did the students take their scientific skills and their scientific knowledge and what was the impact or what has the impact been in society of science teaching. And I claim that a history of science which does not ask these questions remain incomplete regarding scientific knowledge and scientific practice and how it relates to various sections of our societies. Uh, the second uh, uh, dislocation or relocation I would like to uh, propose is acknowledging the diversity and heterogeneity of science uh, and technology education and training. Um, so usually we look as historians of science, look at the history of higher education. Uh, and I, I think that as historians, we have to look at all sections of education and training, including primary schools and vocational training. Uh, the science has been taught in, uh, that has been taught in schools and in teaching education has actually been transformed and we have to re realize that uh, it, it's a different kind of knowledge that has developed a life of its own. Uh, and one of the examples I would give is home science that was taught to women to become good housekeepers, for example, or also electromagnetism taught to electricians, right, in vocational training and in technical colleges. So the kind of electromagnetism we teach there is not the Maxwell equations 
but for example, graphical representations and equivalent circuit diagrams that are much more suited to the kind of application of knowledge. So the electrician's knowledge and skills are significantly different from physicists' knowledge uh, of electricity and the skill sets that uh, physicists, for example, have, right? So skills uh, to measure and understand uh, things like distance, time, temperature, et cetera, are all things that are kind of taught in school and kind of everyday knowledge and skills uh, that a modern, modern citizen should have. With, uh, with Foucault, we could say science education obviously is, is there to discipline populations, to make them fit for modern society, but we can also understand uh, science education as liberating, right? Like an empowering uh, uh, citizens to take part in society and give people agency in a modern techno-scientific world. So the third, so we really have to look at all these sections of uh, science education and training. So the third relocation I propose is uh, placing material culture in the center of our uh, uh, understanding of uh, uh, on our histories of science education or science and technology education. And I will come back to this uh, just in a minute with uh, a number of uh, images and slides. Uh, but I just want to mention the fourth uh, dimension or the fourth dislocation, and that is provincializing Europe and North America in the history of science and technology education. Because even as you will see in our slides, our histories of, his, uh, of science and technology education so far have been predominantly overwhelmingly Eurocentric, right? Like, and obviously science education and uh, technical training has been taking part it had been taking place in all parts of the world, both in pre-colonial as well as in colonial and in post-colonial societies. And as uh, Jim Secord, I think he has also been in the audience, has pointed out, education is central to the circulation and transformation of scientific and technological knowledge on a global level. So if you want to see how this travels, obviously we have to look at, um, at uh, 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 education, if you want to see how scientific uh, knowledge and uh, skills and how technology travels. Um, so uh, just want to show this photo, which I like a lot. This is like a girls school uh, in Norway, in Trondheim, uh, probably secondary school, where you see uh, the girls taking part in a physics class where a man is teaching them with uh, uh, through through lecture demonstrations in electricity. Uh, so the question is a lot. A lot of a lot of the history of science education has been studied through the study of textbooks. The question is how adequate is this really, and how representative do really do students really learn through textbooks, or do they learn through through other kinds of means? For example, through experiments, through experimental lectures, through students' experiments, models, uh, collections of biological specimens and minerals, et cetera. And if you go through our scientific institutions, we will see an abundance of these kind of collections that point towards the material cultures, uh, different kind of material cultures of, uh, uh, of science teaching. And most of our scientific instruments in the historical collections are actually not from research, but are from teaching. If you look at the physical cabinets, for example, of the 18th and 19th century, they're, uh, they're, they're mainly about teaching, as for example, the physical cabinet of the uh, Technical Institute in uh, Florence around 1900, which was uh, the collection of uh, engineering school, and it was about uh, modernizing, uh, industrializing uh, uh, the Tuscany. This is also in, in, uh, in uh, as a homage to Paolo Brenni, who has been uh, the president of the Scientific Instrument Commission for many years, also actually um, a vice president of the DHST between 2009 and 2013. And unfortunately, Paolo Brenni passed away in December 2021. So he studied this collection uh, for decades and produced a lot of videos with original apparatus actually restraging these, uh, these lecture demonstrations. Um, so here we have actually also from the same institute, a photo from the lecture demonstrations in Florence. Here is a photo similar to uh, my own, from my own research from the Norwegian Institute of Technology in Trondheim 1915, where you see here 
the instrument numbers uh, written there and also the, the, the theme for the lecture. This is the shaping of the earth according to Laplace uh, with actually the instrument maker on, on the photo and the set of instruments here, right? So uh, we can learn a lot about this here. There's a lot of these instruments uh, are actually still around. For example, here in this lecture, also from Trondheim from 1915, where you see the Coulomb balance here. Here I have a photo of the Coulomb balance, which we still have. What is very interesting about this Coulomb balance here is that it is actually not, um, not uh, really a measurement instrument because the torsion micrometer is actually a dummy. It's basically a demonstration. So you cannot really do measurements. And this is also very typical for these, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, demonstration experiments that they're not about measurement uh, because they are they're, they're not open-ended. Obviously you cannot create new knowledge in that sense. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, um, disprove the Coulomb balance in, in, in the lecture hall. So we have to talk about, okay, how is actually knowledge created and uh, disseminated through these uh, kind of instruments? So here we have the Coulomb balance from the Max Kohl uh, uh, catalog who was actually a supplier for, for that instrument as well. Um, uh, what we also see is this also slide from Paolo Brenni, uh, the Coulomb balance actually in 1915 was not a research instrument any, anymore, it had a historical connotation, so there's also this kind of relationship between uh, instruments that decline, there's a decline of the use and a transformation of the instru instrument when they're used as, uh, as didactical instruments. Now I want to come to um, to the dissemination and circulation of teaching practices. Uh, also from my own research, this is uh, Robert Pohl, um, who was professor of experimental physics at the University of Göttingen. And these tables, which were used for shadow projection of experiments, uh, were central to Pohl's teaching philosophy and epistemology around his lecture demonstrations. Um, and these instruments were designed for for university teaching, but you also find them in other in other contexts. For example, here this is another secondary school in Norway, where you find Pohl's instruments. So they're disseminated to other kinds of schools and colleges as well, obviously. But they're also uh, circulated and disseminated uh, globally, right? Like so, when I started my professorship at IIT Madras in 2006, 2015. 2016, I found these poll tables uh, at the Department of Physics. They were just about being discarded. Uh, uh, also, if you look around, so this is uh, Gustav Beuermann at the University of Göttingen demonstrating experiments in the rotating chair and the same rotating chair you find at uh, uh, IIT Madras. So this was obviously connected to um, the Indo-German um, um, uh, collaboration in setting up IIT Madras and Werner Koch, who was then uh, a professor who was a, a student of Paul who brought the, the Paul demonstration experiments to, to India, right? Uh, but obviously we have not only, uh, I've talked a lot about uh, lecture demonstrations, we have also other practices, for example, here, student experiments at the Department of Physics at IIT Madras, which is also mainly an engineering college. Or here, we have an example of the Geological Museum at Ferguson College in Pune in India, and also definitely a teaching collection in the context of uh, geology teaching, a college that also started around uh, around uh, 1900 during the colonial times in India. Uh, there is not only scientific instruments, but there are also other, other kinds of objects. For example, this here, this kind of model uh, illustrates description of geometry, very easy, uh, very interesting. You can fold up with strings. So there's a lot of these kind of mathematical models. Uh, this here is a very nice, also from Canada, from Acadia College, um, a tableau uh, with um, uh, with um, uh, with radio tubes, right? Like from Westinghouse, which kind of teaches uh, teaches students here about uh, about radio tubes. Uh, obviously, we know a lot of these kind of things, chemicals used in chemistry teaching, uh, but also uh, models and glassware. This is again from the Cathedral School from Norway. Um, a wall charts, uh, there's a wall chart here. And then if you come to biology teaching, we have a lot of collections like red animal species, specimens or stuffed and mounted animals, but also for example, the herbarium that has been used in, in, in teaching, right? And um, just coming to 
Uh, the end, I, I hope that I have uh, made a convincing among, uh, uh, argument that as historians of science, we have to engage with the history of science education as a core scientific activity. We have to engage with its material cultures and practices in its various forms. And this is essential if you want to understand uh, the generation, diffusion, and circulation of scientific knowledge and skills in our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Roland. Uh, thank you to all three panelists for their uh, wonderful and inspiring talks. So I'm looking at the Q&A. Uh, currently, there are no questions, so please don't feel, you know, reluctant about raising any questions. Feel free to ask questions. So uh, since for now there are no questions, I would like to open the discussion a little bit in the panel. Uh, by kind of relating at least Roland to Noah's talk, but I think there's a side question perhaps for Natasha too. So I agree fully that the study of how science, technology, and medicine impact, shape, and maintain political orders, military powers, and ideologies is a very basic one. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this in relation to science and technology education. So the scientists of tomorrow obviously are now in schools. So here the, the educational question to me at least seems quite key. So I was wondering if either of, of you three have any thoughts on that. And then the broader question is also, and I think this is definitely a question also for the future kind of, is the question of what could be the role of the digital in all of this, also in relation to um, education and then relating this back to this comment about how education can be disciplining, but also liberating. I have the same question with respect to digital projects. They can offer an opportunity to liberate citizens by providing another way of self-educating themselves, but they can also be very restricting. So these are all kinds of questions that came up. And so I leave it to the three panelists now to, to answer, I don't know or comment on this thought. So I don't know if anyone wants to start. Roland? Yeah, obviously, I mean, my argument is, yes, you're right. I mean, the, the future scientists are in the schools, but it's not only about the future scientists. And I think this is a mistake we are making. If you look at the military, for example, obviously what we consider scientific knowledge is needed at all levels in the military, right? Like there's a huge, amount of what we consider scientific knowledge and i mean a lot of it is as a very basic level as i say like right like i mean if you think about like the our our skills to measure to understand like standardized uh, units for example right like that is very important and i would say every soldier in the military obviously needs needs to do that and the military obviously you have this kind of uh, idea of disciplining but also in society right like what does every citizen need to know about science? It's not only about to, to evaluate scientific knowledge, but also to live our everyday lives, right? Like what do we need to know about electricity? And then also my claim is that this is not, this, this kind of knowledge is not the scientific knowledge that scientists necessarily have. It's not only, uh, the idea would be, oh, scientists have that knowledge and even more, but no, a scientist is probably not very good at repairing plugs, for example, right? And understanding circuits in the household. So that there is a transformation of scientific knowledge and that there is also a creation of scientific knowledge in the, the teaching process, right? Like, and we shouldn't be looking the, 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 the making and the dissemination of scientific knowledge as uh, separate, uh, uh, separate uh, units or whatever, right? Any other uh, reactions? Um, on this? Natasha, I do, but Natasha. Sorry, Noah. Yeah, Natasha. Uh, yeah. Please. I just then want Noah. to. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that, uh, as I said, we uh, consider encyclopedia as a, as a perfect medium that acts actually uh, between the scientists and the citizens. And as we know, that encyclopedia always had been uh, like the important component of the um, digital. Uh, or sorry, or the didactic infrastructure in schools. But we also think that they haven't lost their enlightenment role in the digital age, especially when there are uh, so many different unreliable sources of knowledge and where we can be just, uh, when we can, where, where we can offer uh, these reliable sources of, of information on all topics to the average citizen, to specialists and to school population. 
So, and especially in the, this digital age and in Europe, especially with this open access and open science, open access movement, where all these sources are uh, freely available uh, to the public. So we think that it could also be a good channel to, to, to um, disseminate this uh, verified knowledge. And Thank you. So uh, uh, sorry, Noah, before, just to the public again, please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the Q&A uh, because, you know, we won't, don't want this to be just a gathering with the five of us. So you are welcome to join the discussion. Yes, Noah, please go ahead. Um, I wanted to start with an uh, aside before getting to what to me seems like the heart of the issue. And the aside is... Um, like Lisbeth, you you talked about the the change to the digital age, and Roland, one of the one of the things that was most beautiful in your presentation, I mean, literally beautiful, were those slides of the vitrines and of the instruments, and which are so lovely and evocative. And uh, you know, even I grew up at a time when we had those things, and certainly we see them in museums, but but also in the classroom all the time, beakers and and retorts and that sort of thing, and um, and uh, taxidermied animals. But my children didn't grow up with that. My children grew up with are growing up with screens entirely. All of that it doesn't exist anymore, as far as I can tell. At least where you know, at least here in Tel Aviv, and what I know of the United States, basically it's all gone. And that's um, that just is an, an interesting to me, slightly heartbreaking fact because I love those things. But um, and all of it speaks to how important what it is, how how right you are that it's important to study these things because I suspect that change matters, but I don't know how. But all of that, like I said, is an aside to get to the issue of of politics. See again, again to point out how important what you said, uh, Roland, is I. think think that judging from what I I have seen about about science pedagogy especially not in university but also in university is that it continues to act as though the 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 gap between the humanities and the sciences is absolute and so when 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 I think that when kids go into a science class, it's this other realm and the things that they learn in social studies and that they learn in the humanities are completely irrelevant. And I think that everyone, I, I think on both sides of that divide, people work to preserve it. But I think that 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 is um, that that is dangerous and a problem. I mean, specifically from here in Israel, I think that I think that one of the things that allows young people to go into the into the army to be computer programmers to write programs that in, in to be in my particular case you know that to write programs that gather information about say Palestinians and um and make judgments about who is homosexual and who is not homosexual and hand that over to intelligence people who might use that without thinking about it as a political act is because their computer science all through high school has been, you know, this is completely separate from the politics. You can be as leftist as you want. You can be as against the occupation as you want. When you're sitting in front of a computer, you're a computer scientist. And I think that that is, um, I think that's a problem for science pedagogy that needs to be addressed, but I think that it's traditional. Like I think that that divide continues in part because that's just the way that that that's the, the kind of the enlightenment heritage that we come from. Thanks, Noah. So there is a question on the Q&A from Jim uh, Sackert. So the question is, is the distinction between history of technology and history of science as it developed during the late 19th and early 19th century losing its utility? So I'm not sure. Gosh, it sounds like you. Um, Sorry? It sounds like a question that Natasha would be excellent. Natasha, do you have any replies to that question? I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm the right person to address this question to. <laughs> but do you uh, have any? Uh, Roland? Yes, I think I think it's still very relevant. But obviously, we have to, we have to historicize the 
uh, distinction between the history of science and the history of technology. I mean, and specifically also in India, I think I've seen a new relevance. I think it's very kind of contextual. It's very context uh, dependent as well. So both uh, uh, what kind of uh, questions you're asking, right? Like, but also who, who you're really talking to. I mean, if I talk to my uh, students at IIT Madras, right? Like who are science and engineering students, they say, still say technology is applied science, full stop, right? Like, and then obviously I have to go into a kind of debate that we can have very different kind of relationships between science and technology. But I think also what we have to understand is that it's extremely contextual. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right, which is to say, like, the insight behind the question, I think, is is what we, a lot of us, I'm sure, recognize is that the relationship between the history of science and the history of technology is itself a historical relationship that changes in different times and different places that, that ought to be studied. And it's certainly, you know, it, it's certainly under all sorts of pressures now, um, without question. So perhaps I might return very briefly to this question of, you know, this persistent gap between the humanities and the sciences and the problems this give rise to. So I was wondering if you have any, you know, if you if you think this a bit more globally, if you could think of, of other approaches to this. So for me, I have always experienced this as a very Western divide. And I can imagine other histories of no, Roland. I see you are please. You are you are no. At my institution, it's even worse than in uh, at my institution, and I would say in India in general, it's even worse than in Europe. There's a total a disregard for the humanities among scientists and engineers. It's even worse the kind of divide that uh, that Noah actually has uh, has mentioned, right? And uh, so I'm teaching, obviously I'm teaching, I'm kind of sitting in the middle of the divide, also somebody as like from my generation, very typical came from the sciences, came from physics, being at a humanities department. Uh, but I would say it's 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 a big problem, but it's it's very deep in, in education in this year. And I would totally agree with Noah, very deep in, in education in India, right? Uh, so uh, education in India is still very much based on exam learning, rote learning, learning things by heart. And uh, it's mainly looked at as a competition, right? Like, so I have a lot of engineering students. I ask them, why do you study electrical engineering? What fascinates you? And people tell me it's nothing. It's the great, my cut, right? Like my cut in the exam that put me at electrical engineering and I will have a great career, right? So that's the idea and the, the kind of idea which is very prominent in India that people who do humanities are losers, right? They they didn't make it good in school, right? Like, and that's why they do humanities. And uh, and it, it creates a very difficult, uh, uh, as uh, somebody has said very rightly, in India, we don't have universities. We have institutions of higher learning, which are very much in a silo. So the idea of a university and even the discourse on what is the role of science in society? What is the role of a public institution like the IIT Madras is a very alien question to our students, right? Like when I come up with these questions, they've never, they've never confronted these questions, right? So I think it's even more difficult and it's also without going into the details. I mean, if you look at the political climate in India right now, right? Like it's, 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 not, it's not a very good situation. And specifically humanities teaching institutions are under attack, right? So, okay, I think we should end our session. Uh, given this, this topic, I would definitely recommend you to have a, a look at uh, the, the papers we kind of used as a partial inspiration for the festival by Kostas Gavroglu, which is exactly about this, you know, the threat of a second death to the humanities. So, okay, so let's uh, stop here. Uh, I thank uh, the panelists for their uh, great talks. I also enjoyed the discussion very much. I think a number of very basic topics came up. So thank you again. And uh, I propose we close this session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, I think we started. Good morning, good night, good evening, good afternoon all. <laughs> and uh, be welcome to this webinar.
and we will start uh, quickly, just not to waste time with presentations. Uh, we will present our three speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Kit Pampano, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Catholic University at Leuven, having taught for many years course on the history of science. His research interests are the history of science in Belgium and the Low Countries after 1500, and the history of universities, the popular culture of science, and the use of scientific procedures in the examination of art. Professor Van Pamo will present the paper, How to Forget About the Scientific Revolution. Professor Van Pamo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabiano. Uh, you can hear me. Everything's all right. Yes. Yeah. So my title is how to forget about the scientific revolution. I have been teaching for the whole of my career courses on the history of science and in particular scientific revolution is there was the most central, the most defining concept in the history of science as we teach it. It is virtually impossible to 